Hi everyone, Fritz here. In today's video, we're gonna go over your aerobic respiration. Now, the last time we talked about respiration, we talked about it in the anaerobic aspect, where we have a bacteria where its desire is to get or make some kind of ATP. And we talked about this in the process of fermentation, but we also mentioned that in the process of making these two ATP from fermentation, we're also gonna get two NADH. And these two NADH will help cycle back to the bacteria to repeat the fermentation process. And what we didn't talk about is bacteria that have the ability to use air to generate more than two ATP and two NADH. Now, whether the bacteria is an anaerobe or aerobe, it will always start off with this process. But if it is able to use air and has the presence of air, it will go down a cascade of events that will allow it to generate more ATP, specifically 32 ATP. So how does it get here? Well, from here, we already know that our bacteria started out with a glucose molecule, which is a six carbon molecule. It will then break it down through a process called glycolysis. As we've already mentioned before, with anaerobic respiration, we start off with a glucose molecule. This glucose molecule will go through a process called glycolysis. And once we're done with glycolysis, our glucose will be processed into two pyruvate molecules. But in that process of glycolysis, we get our two ATP and two NADH. Now, what happens after this step can only be achieved by bacteria that are aerobes. Although the next step that we're gonna go over, pyruvate decarboxylation, is technically still an anaerobic step. We take these two pyruvate and put it through pyruvate decarboxylation, which will convert our two pyruvate molecules to two acetyl-CoA's. And just like glycolysis, pyruvate decarboxylation gains us some energy here in the form of two more NADH. Now, lastly, we're gonna take our two acetyl-CoA molecules and put it through the last process of the electron transport chain, Krebs, or TCA. All of them meaning the same thing. And once our two acetyl-CoA's have fully gone through the electron transport chain, we can expect to get two more ATP, two FADH2, and six NADH. And now once we add all these things up together, you can see that we have four ATP, two FADH2, and 10 NADH. But you might be saying to yourself, Fritz, I thought we were gonna get 32 ATP, not four in these other molecules that you mentioned, and I'm not sure about what the significance is. Well, their significance comes into play because we actually don't put the two acetyl-CoA through the electron transport chain. They do act as reactants, but what we're also doing in the electron transport chain is transporting the electrons from FADH2 and NADH. And once those electrons have been transported, we can expect that one and a half ATP approximately, and 2.5 ATP will be generated for each molecule. So this comes out to three ATP, and this comes out to 25 ATP. So no need to whip out your calculators, it's just simple addition. Four plus five, 29, plus three, is 32. And that's how we get 32 ATP. Now, depending on the textbook and the actual processes that the bacteria go through, 
This number can vary, but you can expect it to be anywhere in the realm of 28 to 36. Because this is a microbiology class and not a biochemistry class, I really think it would be extremely cruel for your teachers to give you something like, how many ATP is created at the end of the electron transport chain? Is it 28, 30, 32, or 36? That to me would be extremely rare. In my experience, they'll give you some numbers that might have some correlation or no correlation at all, but they're gonna be very off from this range right here. So they could say two, which would be related to fermentation. They could also say 13, not related at all. They might even say 36, this would be the right answer. And then another wrong answer would be 22. 22 is not close to 28. So just remember 28 to 36, that's the range that you can expect when going through the electron transport chain. And here are some additional questions that you can expect on test day. Now feel free to answer those questions down in the comment section below and leave any questions that you have down there as well. And don't forget to check the description for additional study materials. And don't forget to leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future microbiology videos. And I'll see all of you guys in the next one.